Man, my heart for every single person in this room or every single person watching online uh, is that you would know that God is good and that his ways are good. And if only we would follow him in all of our ways with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that everything would work out because God is good and he loves us and he has a good plan for our life. And so I hope you believe that this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, and so I'll invite you at this time to go ahead and just uh, open up there. And as you're doing that, uh, I have a question for you, a reflective question for you, and that question is, how do you deal with the unexpected? How do you deal with the unexpected? The unexpected things that happen in your life. They can be big things or they can be small things. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, It's a busy day at work and you got a lot of meetings ahead of you and you get a call and it's, hey, this is uh, your kid's school. Uh, Your kid threw up. You need to come pick them up, right? (laughs) You know, relatable experience. Maybe uh, your car breaks down. Uh, Maybe, uh, you know, you get sick in the middle of a really busy season. You know, interruptions or, or these unexpected things that happen in our life can also be bigger, more serious. Maybe the phone call is, this is the doctor's office and we need you to come back because we found something. We all have the unexpected things that happen in our lives. And, um, you know, I've heard it said that like the gap between what you expect to happen and what, you, what actually happens is where disappointment and frustration and anger and doubt about God come in. And that gap between what we expect, what we want to happen, and the actuality of what's actually happening to us. And I think that's especially true in the Christian life, right? In the Christian life, we know that we're supposed to be experiencing peace and joy and, and all of these things. But if we're honest, sometimes it feels like we'll read the Bible and we'll see these verses about having overwhelming joy. And we're looking around at everyone else like, <laughs> did, did, did I miss something here? I'm, I'm kind of missing it here, Lord. I'm not feeling what I think I should be feeling. Those moments deep within our soul when we expect to be experiencing this overwhelming peace and joy of God and peace in our circumstances, but all our circumstances are doing are just giving us anxiety and fear and disappointment. Maybe you can relate to that. That's especially true in the Christmas season, right? That, that feeling, that pressure we feel like kind of intensifies during the Christmas season because in the Christmas season, there's a lot of expectations on that season for being good and being joyful. There's a lot of pressure on us and like every sphere of life. In your home life, you're expected to kind of do well for your kids and host holiday parties and drag the ladder out for the Christmas lights, right? And swipe the credit card and that's giving you anxiety. At work, there's a lot of anxiety and pressure on your life as well, right? Year-end reports and everyone's calling out sick and on vacation, so you're covering for different people around the Christmas season. Um, Even your church, your kids' schools, Christmas performances and choirs, and you got to dress them up, and all, all those things are good, but we can feel the gap between how we think we're supposed to feel and what we're actually feeling. This morning, I want to talk about the unexpected. I, I want to go through a journey through the Christmas story, this classic story that we all know. We know Mary, we know Joseph, we know the angel, we know the shepherds, we know the story, but I want to take us through that story, and I, I want us to use that as a, a way for us to see a biblical response to the unexpected things that happen in our life. I want you to internalize this this morning. I've been praying all week that you would have not a fresh hope for like next year. Like this might not take you into next year, but I hope that you have a fresh hope for today. I'm going to drop a very deep theological truth on you this morning that comes straight from this story that you may have never realized. And if you would only internalize this truth, speak it to your soul, And believe it not just this morning, but believe it Monday morning and Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning when the phone call comes, I believe that you will have that peace in your life. Here's the truth. Interruptions are invitations. Interruptions are invitations. I think most people, if we're honest, when we think about experiencing the peace of God, we, we picture ourselves getting away from the chaos of the world, away from our schedules, away from our calendars, into that quiet place with God so that we can go find that peace. And I think that's true, right? Even at our church, we have a spiritual rhythm of starting our day with God and, and making sure that we are starting and being alone with him. So there's a lot of truth for that. 
But what if I told you this morning that you don't need to get away from the chaos to experience the peace of God, but in fact, in the midst of these interruptions, in the midst of the unexpected, God is actually speaking to us and longs for us to have the peace that we also long for. Interruptions are not obstacles to, of, to peace, but rather divine invitations from God. And I think the Christmas story shows us that. So in the midst of your, your busyness, in the midst of the interruptions and the unexpected, you can see these things as being either good, you can see these interruptions as being bad, or you can see them as being divine. And that's what the Christmas story tries to teach us. So let's go into it this morning. Let's learn how we respond in these places of interruption. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, and I'll read through verse 14 here at the beginning. It said, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's stop there. So whenever I, like, I read a Christmas story, or whenever I read any story in the Bible, I like to remind myself that these people that we're reading about are real people, right? And we're reading Luke chapter 2. They don't know what happens in Luke chapter 3. We get the benefit of knowing that because we got the whole Bible. We get to read what happens in these people's lives, but they don't have that benefit. They're regular people of faith who have to live their life a day at a time trusting the Lord. Let me, let me drop a hint on you. You do not know the next chapter of your life. You don't know what happens next. And so as we read these stories, as we read about shepherds and Mary and Joseph and these people who have the divine encounters and interruptions in their life, it's good for us to, to look at how they respond as people of faith because we are also people of faith. These are real people and they have something to teach us this morning. So as we talk about interruptions as being invitations, the first uh, way that they're invitations is that interruptions are invitations to witness God's plan unfold in our lives. They're invitations to see God at work. Do you believe that God has a plan for this world in your life? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is good and has a plan for your life? The Christmas story invites you to believe that. When you read the Christmas story for what it is, it is a good God with a good plan for the world and who is fixing the problems and brokenness of the world by sending his son into the world. So the Christmas story invites us to believe that God has a plan and that we get to watch his plan unfold in our lives. Picture it, right? Picture this, this story of these shepherds. Midnight settles over the field. It gets dark. They're settling in for like the, the night shift of shepherding world, whatever that looks like. And then there's a burst of light, bright light, and an angel appears with good news and words of assurance. Do not be afraid, which apparently angels are terrifying because they always say that first. They always say that like, do not be afraid. So I guess when you like look at an angel, it's like, sir, this, this is the most terrifying moment of my life. <laughs> do not be afraid. But all of this puts the shepherds in the proximity to a divine plan. And there's a divine message. Don't you see it? God on his throne tells his angel to go tell these shepherds a message. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Like, most of us don't like interruptions, if we're honest, right? We have a plan, we know where we're going, we know what we want to do today, and interruptions are deviations to that plan. I think about the shepherds, like, I don't know if there's like the shepherd, like a shepherd's five-year plan, <laughs> like the shepherd's got like the five-year plan. This is not in the five-year plan. 
Like, let, let me be honest with you guys, in like the most loving and warm way possible, like God laughs at your five-year plan. Like, I'll just be honest. He just, he loves you. God laughs at the five-year plan. But in fact, interruptions are invitations for the world, or for us to see God's plan unfold in our life. I mean, I think far too often we get so caught up in our plans, our goals, our preferences, that we don't even notice what God is up to right now in our life. But God's MO, his method of operation, has always been to work through the unexpected. He works through unexpected people, like Mary. Who would think that God would use Mary, this like poor peasant virgin woman, to be the mother of the Savior of the world? He worked through shepherds who were the outcasts of society, not the people who were in like the big halls, the rich, the powerful, the famous. God always works through the unexpected. And when you look at through the Bible, all through the Bible, the places where you think God is going to work, <laughs> he ain't working there. And the places where you think he's least going to work, that's where God is working. I wonder what that means for your life as you think about the places where God is working. If you're going to be a happy Christian, you have to expect God to work through the unexpected, through the interruptions. I like to say it this way, to plan is human, but to interrupt is divine. And we have to remember that. God is God and we are not. Let me give you some friendly <laughs> pastoral advice this morning, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone, I'm sorry if I make you mad. You are not the author of your life. You're not the author of your life. And that terrifies us. That's why we build online profiles perfectly curated and we put it and present it to the world because that's the kind of like, this is the life that I want. This is the life that I want you to think that I have. We cannot control our own life, so we go online to create this narrative of a life that does not exist. You are not the author of your life. But God does have a plan for your life. And so this Christmas season or any season in which we feel like our life is being interrupted, and they could be small interruptions or big interruptions to our life plan, the question we should be asking is, God, what are you up to? That's the heart. You can see how like that's a heart posture that gets you into a place to where like now, okay, I'm not responding to the interruptions with, with anger or frustration. Now it's like, okay, in the interruption is opportunity. And the question you should be asking throughout any day, throughout any sickness, throughout any interruption, is, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? Because if you believe that God is good and he has a good plan for your life, then whatever he's doing is also good and he will work it out in the end. Interruptions are invitations to watch God's plan unfold in the world, but also in your life. Look at verses 15 through 17. So when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. All right, so let's recap. Shepherds out in the field, dark of night, angels come down, like just like scare the, the shepherds, bring a good news. And then the, to me, like the funniest part is like they sing a song and then they, they just chunk deuce. They're out of there, back up into heaven, right? And the, the shepherds are like, did you, did you see that? You know, like what, what, like what was in our dinner? You know, like was this real? But I want to share a detail that, uh, man, I've missed this every single time that I have read this story. So I'm a, I've been reading this story for a long time, and I've missed this detail every single time, and I wonder if you missed it as well. I always thought that the angels commanded the shepherds to go see Jesus and tell Mary and Joseph the message. I thought that they commanded them to do that, but they don't. The only command that the angel gives is what? Do not be afraid. That's literally the only command that they give to the shepherds. Which means that this encounter with the divine, this divine interruption, compelled the shepherds to go and to share and to see and to experience. So interruptions are not just invitations to witness God's plan, 
but to become active participants in his plan by responding to it with love and compassion. Interruptions are invitations to respond with love and compassion. Every single one of these characters in the Christmas story, whether it's Mary or the shepherds or the wise men or Joseph, they respond with obedience and love and compassion. What did Mary say? Like she hears this fantastic news and she's like, okay, that wasn't a part of my plan. But how does she respond? She says, I'm the Lord's servant. And the shepherds, they, they go. It, to me, the funniest part is they, they leave the flock, which I guess the flock's going to be okay for a couple of hours, right? So they go and they check it out and then eventually they come back. The point is that they respond enthusiastically and joyful. They don't just watch the plan unfold. They become participants in the plan. Let me give you uh, what I think is like a cool uh, maybe example of that. There was a heartwarming story like a couple of years ago where there was a a grandma who was inviting um, her like grandkids to Thanksgiving dinner. I don't know if you remember, it's a viral uh, story that that came out a couple of years ago. And uh, she texted this, uh, one of her grandkids, and she gave the details for the Thanksgiving dinner, you know, like 5 p.m. at my house, you know, we're, we're having Thanksgiving and, or, you know, turkey and cobbler, whatever it is. And uh, the, the reason the story went viral is that that message landed in the inbox of a, a 17-year-old young man who was also in her city who was not her uh, grandson. Uh, so it was not her grandson. And so it landed in his inbox, and his name was Jamal Hinton. And uh, like true story, he responds with a picture of himself And he says, you're not my grandma, but can I still get a plate? Which was like super awesome. And so right now, I think I have a picture of it. They are on their eighth Thanksgiving together. These two people celebrating Thanksgiving together. And the the most wonderful part of the story is like, you know, he says, can I still get a plate? And she responded that first year, of course you can. That's what grandmas do, feed everyone. Can all the grandmas in the room just give it up? That's a true story right there. All the grandmas in the room. A lot of different ways that he could have responded. A lot of different ways he could have responded to that. He could have ignored it. I don't know if you've ever gotten text messages that, like, you're like, okay, I don't know who this is. It's a spam. Like, who is this person? So he ignores it. But he doesn't, right? Instead, he responds and he says, hey, like, I'm going to create a human interaction here. And then later on, they described it as like the best Thanksgiving ever. They've been doing it every year. In fact, to make the story even more crazy, like, they like, now they'd have Thanksgiving dinner. They like rented out an Airbnb and like every year now they're going to invite other people who don't have families for Thanksgiving to like do, you know, have Thanksgiving dinner together. And it's just like an incredible story. <laughs> it's a good message. Got to be heard, you know. Interruptions are invitations. <laughs> I wonder, (laughs) everyone's like, dial back in. Um, I I wonder for you guys, do you respond to the interruptions in our life with love and compassion? Like, is this interruption the possibility for a divine appointment? How do you respond to interruptions? Frustration, anger, clawing back of your time and focus? When I look at Jesus, one of the things that I respect about him the most is that he was never irritated by interruption. Never. If anyone had a place to be, it was Jesus, right? I know you're busy. I'm busy. We got places to be. If there's anyone who has a place to be, it's Jesus. And yet every time he's on his way somewhere, he couldn't go two steps without people pulling out his cloak or literally blocking his path. Like, heal my grandma, heal my sister, my servant is sick. Whatever it is, people were literally blocking his path. But here's what's crazy. 
Whenever Jesus talks to those people, it's as if like those places in front of those people were exactly where Jesus was meant to be. And even in my own ministry and life, I love having a lot of responsibility. Like, I like that. Maybe you do too. It's good to have a lot of responsibility and be in charge of a lot of things. And that's a part of growing up. It's a part of maturing. And so that's a good thing. But what I don't like, and this happens a lot, especially outside of my like immediate family, is that oftentimes people will come up to me and the first thing that they'll say is, I know you're busy, but... Ever get that? <laughs> a lot of you, when you come to me on a Sunday, I know you're busy, but. And I get it, right? I, I walk fast, and I, I get to the point fast, and when I tell my team to do something, I expect them to do it fast. Like, I, I get that. Many of you are the same way. We want to get stuff done, and we want to do it right. But listen, I want you to lean in. I, I want you to dial into this. When I die, I do not want to be known for being busy. I want to be known for being loving. I want that to be the legacy of my life. I just want that sentence, just to put that on the screen, I, just, I want that to sit there for a second. When I die, I don't want to be known for being busy. I want to be known for being loving. Just look at that. One of the most convicting statements that anyone has ever said to me was, James, you walk too fast. You need to slow down and walk at the speed of love. Do you walk at the speed of love? What's the legacy of your life? Getting a lot of stuff done, being busy, or is it being loving? Let me ask you a different question because this applies to every person in this room. What's an interruption in your life that you are struggling with right now? What's that thing or that circumstance or that sickness or even that person in your life that's challenging you or causing you to lose heart or to lose faith or to draw back? I wonder, what's that for you? Now, here's the deeper question that we all have to wrestle with this morning. What's the invitation in the interruption? What's the invitation in that interruption? What's God doing? What's he up to? What's his plan? How are you called to respond with love and compassion in those things? Interruptions are God's reminders that he sets the agenda and God's agenda is love. It has always been love. Are we responding to the interruptions in our life with love and compassion or with selfishness and busyness? Look at verse 18 through the end of our passage. And it said, All who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard, just as it had been told them. Look at their reactions. There's treasuring, there's pondering, there's glorifying, there's praising. Interruptions are not just invitations for us to see God's plan unfold or be a part of his plan, but they are invitations for us to wonder and to worship. Look what Mary does. Amidst all these interruptions, all of these unknowns, like pregnancy is scary enough uh, when you expect it to happen, but then like when you don't expect it to happen. But in the midst of all of that, it says she treasured up all these things in her heart. She allowed herself to find wonder in God's plan and ponder the significance of Jesus and his birth. And then the shepherds, after witnessing this extraordinary event, they glorify God, they praise God, they have a deep reverence and worship for what God is doing. They leave with wonder and awe. 
Do you see interruptions in your life as divine encounters that are calling us to respond with wonder and worship that God would be so gracious as to actually have a plan for your life? Like thinking of you specifically, not just the cosmic order of the world, but you specifically. How do you respond with wonder and worship? Let me give you just three practical ways that you can do that this morning. Three ways to worship your way through the interruptions of the season and of your life. Number one, be open to letting God interrupt your plans and priorities. Be open to that. That's a posture, right? That's a heart posture of spiritual openness. And maybe that starts with how you plan your day. You know, like I love the story, there's no room for Jesus in the inn. Is there room for Jesus in the schedule? Or do you book everything back to back to back to back? And if there's any deviation to your plan, (laughs) that God's got to say, oh, I'm sorry, can I fit in that 15-minute slot? Look, God doesn't need an empty calendar to work in your life. So we have a heart posture of openness, like our plans, our priorities are all open-handed. God, whatever you want to do. Number two, be attentive to the people who cross your path who need help or attention. Be attentive to the people who cross your path who need help or attention. The other day I was... um, (laughs) busy on my way to go do something here at the church. I think it was like fixing the lights, which if you ever drive by the church at night, I'm really proud of our lighting and the advances that we've made in that. I know it's a simple thing, but it's not like totally scary around here anymore. And so I think I was, I was going and trying to fix those a little bit. And uh, there was a a guy in our church who came and uh, we were talking and uh, I could tell that like, he was like, Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? And I could tell he kind of was like lingering and he wanted to talk a little bit more and, and had that like moment that decision moment, right? Okay, am I going to, all right, man, I'll talk to you on Sunday. Am I going to go or am I going to stay and engage in this conversation? And because I was preaching this message, I was like, okay, I need to stay. I need to engage. I need to talk. And I'm so thankful I did. It was an encouraging one uh, conversation, but it was also, it was like a deep one. And it was one that I knew that I needed to be a part of. So be open to these interruptions. Maybe it's like your kid interrupting you while you're working or in a conversation with someone. Maybe it is a stranger. Uh, Maybe it is a family member. Like we, we all have needs in our lives. And the reason that God gives us one another is we're called to meet one another's needs. So be attentive to the people who cross your path, who need help or attention. And then number three, rejoice in all circumstances because there is always a reason to rejoice. That's the gospel. There's always reason to rejoice. Like God, God can work in the mess. He's been doing it since the beginning. God can work in the mess of your life. There's always a reason to rejoice. Even if it's sickness, even if it's an interruption in your day, even if it's an interruption in your plan, didn't get into that school, didn't get that job, got laid off from that job, family member sick, whatever it is. We don't rejoice for those things, but we rejoice in those things because we have a good God who loves us. You can worship in the midst of interruption. You don't need a quiet time to do that, though that's good, but you can worship in the midst of the interruptions of your life. We draw to a close uh, this morning. I want to take just a moment, just a couple of minutes, to speak to any person who maybe is just down this season. I don't know what it is, but like December is just an abnormal month, and we're a lot more like contemplative in this month. Like January, you're going to be like going to the gym and getting your diet going, right, and like doing all that kind of stuff. But December is that weird kind of like. I want to think about my life right now, and and so I want to speak to any person in this room who might be just just down or doubting or woe is me because of something that you're going through, I just want to speak to you uh, for a moment because I I know it's hard to do these things. And so I want to speak to you that even though, even though like we get interrupted and your plans get interrupted and your health gets interrupted, your finances get interrupted, I want to remind you that like God is never interrupted. God's never caught off guard. God's plans are never thwarted. God's 
never thinking like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now in this person's life? He always knows. God is never interrupted. And I know that I can say that, and it's one thing for me to say that, but I, I want you to visualize it. And so, man, I, I saw something that I, I think just like, man, it, it, if, if what I'm saying can be uh, materialized or seen in a picture, it's going to be in this picture that I'm about to show you. So I'm going to throw this picture up on the screen, and I just want you to look at this picture. So this picture is a visual representation of every cross reference in the Bible. So if you're not familiar with what a cross reference is, it's basically whenever you, uh, you're reading a verse and there's like a little letter at the end of that verse and then you go down to the very bottom of your Bible or you click on the link uh, on your phone and it'll say like Psalm 14.5 or like Exodus 2.7 or something like that, which basically means that there's a part of the Bible that's speaking to or alluded to this verse that you're about to read and look at. And so this chart right here, this graph, this picture, is a visual representation of every cross-reference in the Bible. Every time a verse speaks to another verse or harkens back to another verse or looks forward to the gospel or to the future. And someone did the math. You know that subreddit, they did the math. Someone did the math. There are 63,779 cross-references in the Bible. By the way, you can buy this thing on Etsy. I'm gonna put this up in my office because this is awesome. And I bring that up because if God can work through the thousands of years that the Bible spans, and the authors, and the peoples, and the circumstances, and the world events. How much more so can God orchestrate and have a plan for our little lives? God is never interrupted. God is always interrupting for his good plan, but he is never interrupted. And I think we should especially be familiar and know that deep in our hearts in the Christmas season to not be frustrated or discouraged by interruptions, but instead let your heart and your mind and your soul be open to the fact that God may be unfolding his very plan in front of you. Do you hold fast to the knowledge that God is unwavering? And the whole point of the Bible is that God is unwaveringly faithful to his people. There's so many reasons for every person in this room to rejoice, to rejoice and trust the God of ages. So I don't know who you are this morning, but I want you to receive that deep within your soul. God's at work. He's doing something. He's always up to something good. How do you respond to that? You respond by being open yourself to the people around you, and you respond with worship.